Father, we pause to give you thanks for your great love and thank you for your son who brought it to us, delivered it to us. Lord, open our eyes to it. Father, as we come now to your word, we just ask that we would be renewed and, and afreshed in that love, that we would have a fuller and deeper understanding of it and what that love calls us to do and be as your dear and beloved people. We ask this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Well, good morning, Parkview. It is a privilege to be uh, in the pulpit again. It's uh, been a little bit of time. Um, it's always a joy to teach in the Sunday school programs here at Parkview, but there's something special about being gathered with the corporate body today and looking out at uh, all of my brothers and sisters in Christ, I just appreciate being here, and it's my privilege to serve you in this uh, way today. I hope to be helpful to you in uh, many ways. And uh, I just want to, uh, I, I really kind of just want to jump right in. Uh, should be no surprise to you, I have a lot of material to cover this morning, and uh, we're going to, by God's grace, get through it. But could you be making your way to the book of Acts? And in particular, Acts chapter 8 is going to be our text. <clears throat> As you're turning there today, I wanted to bring you in on a little prayer request. You can be in prayer for me, um, as well as the Southern Hills Bible Church in Custer, South Dakota. They are now without a pastor. He has moved on to another ministry, and they are in a transition period. And as they are seeking for the next pastor, they have reached out to me and asked if I could occasionally fill the pulpit and kind of carry a little bit of weight until they uh, land on, on a new minister there. So um, next week, I will start that. I'll have a couple of breaks in between, and then... Um, it could go into the fall. We just don't know. You can be in prayer for them. They prayed for us last week of all, and, and uh, very generous and caring church, and uh, we should be in prayer for them as well for their time of, of transition. Well, if you've uh, made it to Acts, I'd like you to look uh, beginning in Acts 8, and I'm going to pick up reading right away in verse 25. I've entitled this message this morning, the believer's first step. And I think by the time we get to the bottom of the text, you'll see why I've done that. Let's look at verse 25 of Acts chapter 8. And so when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And he arose and went, and behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. And when Philip had run up, he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his justice was taken away. Who will tell his generation, for his life is removed from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, whom does the prophet say this, of himself or someone else? And Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Verse 38 says, he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. As I mentioned, I titled today's message, The Believer's First Step, and I could probably also entitle it, Baptism the believer's first step. This is the conversion story of this Ethiopian eunuch, and it's a notable story because it culminates with a very dramatic baptism at the end of it. This baptism served as this Ethiopian convert's first step of faith. 
It's a lesson on baptism today. You'll find kind of a little bit more of an instructional approach because there's a lot of questions that surround this issue of baptism, and they may be in your mind as well. Why a lesson on baptism? Well, I have to ask that same question because I tried to preach a different lesson today. I, was, I have a completed message in the book of Matthew on the one another's and, and, and dealing with one another and, and confronting with one another in love, and that is all set and locked and loaded and ready to go, but it just wasn't happening. And God just kept bringing me back to this. And then I tried a different one in Philippians, and God just kept bringing me back to this. So for some reason here, God wants us to, to focus on this today. Now, there are some good reasons. Baptism, the topic of it, is shrouded in confusion in the church. And this should not surprise us. No doubt this is satanic confusion. Whenever the topic of baptism comes up, the devil wants to get right in there. And, and he does this to create confusion in the mind of the church and the people of the church. He wants to break the pattern of Christian obedience is why. Satan wants from the beginning to intervene in your obedience to this very important command, and he does so. And church history proves that, does it not? I mean, just take a quick journey with me through church history, beginning perhaps with the Quakers, or also known as the Friends Movement. They don't believe in New Testament baptism, and they don't practice it whatsoever. Likewise, members of the Salvation Army will not practice baptism. They say that was for an era gone by. We are now in the new New Testament era, and we, we don't baptize. That's one extreme. Take another extreme, the Church of Christ, you've heard of this, who believe in baptismal regeneration. They say, oh yeah, you need to be baptized because you won't get to heaven without it. And, then, and so they believe that, that baptismal regeneration is the key, and you can't be saved without baptism. Add in this the Mormons who practice each year two and a half million proxy baptisms, baptisms for the dead. Have you heard of this? Where they will baptize for their dead ancestors, hoping, praying, and baptizing their way into hopefully a different or better destiny. The Roman Catholic teaching on baptism where infants are sprinkled. Some of you may have come from this tradition where you were sprinkled as, a, as an infant. That, that belief is that in sprinkling, in the Roman Catholic, Catholic system, sprinkling cleanses the baby, the newborn, cleanses the baby from original sin, starts the process of the new birth, and the process of salvation, which the church will assist with throughout the entire life of that child in, on into adulthood, uh, even upon the deathbed. Lutherans who who were known for that great Reformation doctrine of justification by faith, never really shook the grave clothes, as it were, of infant baptism, and also, in, also baptized babies. Though they believed in justification by faith, Lutherans taught that somehow a parent can pray a prayer on behalf of that baby, somehow a parent can answer questions on behalf of that baby, and somehow that a parent can even, in some cases, believe on behalf of that baby little infant. The Presbyterian Church in many reform circles will also baptize infants, not for any of those above reasons, but for reasons believing that baptism has replaced circumcision. And of old, on the eighth day, the male ch children of Israel would be circumcised under the old covenant, and they say, well, now we're in the new covenant, so we need also a counterpart, and so uh, those of the reform tradition, Presbyterian tradition, will baptize the only problem is they'll baptize both males and female babies, so there's some inconsistency there, but making them little miniature members of the new covenant. And yet the scripture clearly teaches you don't become a member of the new covenant by birth. You become a member of the new covenant by being born again. You not only need to be born once, you have to be born twice to, to enter the kingdom, says Jesus in John 3. And then... The Anabaptists come along and say, no, 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 no. If you were baptized as a baby, you have to be re-baptized as an adult. And sometimes they were greatly persecuted for this. And the Anabaptists, it was made a capital offense to baptize a believer a second time. That's where the word comes from. Anna means, again, twice baptized. And there's some horrific stories where 
those who oppose that method of baptism, believer's baptism, were baptized and held under the water and kept under the water and drowned for their faith. With, with all of this, I can see why people say, you know, all this confusion, I just don't want to get involved in baptism. And it can be put off and put off and put off. And that's right where Satan wants us to be with this topic. With the widespread confusion comes widespread indifference, ignorance, just not having time for it. He knows if he can confuse believers early, they'll become passive about this. And this ignorance and indifference towards baptism leads to a very strange, strange paradox in the Christian world. You've heard me speak of this in times past. You've probably witnessed this. The paradox is this, that the world is full of baptized non-believers. And it, while at the same time it is also full of unbaptized believers. Have you seen this? Have you seen this world where countless of people have been baptized by mode of infant baptism, sprinkling per se, which is not a biblical method of baptism? Or well-meaning parents will foist the true ceremony upon young children who may or may not be ready to make this level of commitment to Christ, but well-meaning parents care enough to, to push and and as a result, what happens is these children, either baptized as infants or very young baptized in the proper way, have nothing to do with Christ when they grow up. They have nothing to do with the church. And they don't know the Lord genuinely. The other half of this paradox is that at the same time, there's a large group of people who are genuine believers, who have been born again, who love Christ, and who wish to serve Christ and they have not been baptized. They have not come full step in obedience to their Lord. And some of you may be in this category this morning. Some of you may be in the above category and have seen that in your upbringing, but some of you may be in the second category. You love the Lord, you want to serve the Lord, but you have not yet been obedient to this step. This is a strange, strange paradox. And with the upcoming celebration that we will all witness in three weeks with Parkview's annual baptism, really celebration is what it is. I want you to be armed with the truth. I want you to be ready and understand some of the history and understand what we are doing when it comes to baptism. Can I just say one more thing by way of introduction? I believe that um, failure to take baptism seriously as a Christian is likely at the root of so many deep-seated problems in the local church, deep-seated problems in relationships, deep-seated problems in personal lives as they attempt to serve the Lord faithfully. You say, wow, Eli, that's a pretty bold statement. Baptism is the key to some of my, the, the issue, the root issue between with some of my problems in life? Yes, it is. And the reason it is is because if you are not willing or able or whatever it is to take the very first step, the believer's first step of obedience. If you are not able to take the smallest step in the safest environment where we all love you, how are you going to be willing to take the hard steps? The hard steps like staying married when it's easier to leave that relationship. To, to testifying to a world of unbelievers and a world of, of, of people who don't know God in the workplace. And you have not taken the first, very first baby step. And so I believe that this is, this is key to us knowing a certain victory. Well, that's, that's a huge introduction there. I apologize for that. But I just want to set the tone as to how important this topic is. We want to we look at our text today. And this, this text really divides into five simple parts. I'm going to I'm going to kind of give you a jet tour of the text because we are just simply not going to be able to cover really each verse the way it deserves. And then I'm going to land you on the fifth point of this and really ask some key questions about baptism and, and what it means. First of all, I mean, you don't have to take these notes, but it gives you an idea in your mind where we're going here. The five simple parts of this, number one, we see some divine intervention occurring. Verses 25 and 26. This, uh, these disciples were minding their own business, and actually they were minding God's business. They were doing God's business God's way, preaching the gospel. And an angel of the Lord comes and intervenes on them. 
and says, you've been here in Samaria. I want you to go south now to the desert road. And Philip gets this from the angel. He rises and goes immediately, and this intervention on the part of God occurs. You'll see even your own lives will, you'll start to see some of these things in your own lives, this divine intervention that occurs. Go to Gaza, he says, towards Gaza. Secondly, we see a divine appointment, verses 27 to 29. There's a reason. God doesn't just intervene and say, go here for no reason. There's a reason, and the reason is that there's an Ethiopian official, a high-ranking official, uh, who is of the, uh, the uh, uh, official of Candace. This was uh, briefly a, um, a title. This was the queen's court. This was the queen mother's court. In other words, the queen, there's the king, the queen, and there's a son who's going to be king. That son was then cared for and brought up in the queen's court of Candace. Very important. And was heading somewhere. And this eunuch was in charge of that court and in charge of all her treasure. So there was, there was a divine intervention for the purpose of a divine appointment that needed to be kept. And he's reading, he's a God-fearer coming back from Jerusalem, and he's reading in the book of Isaiah. And Philip gets this divine command that says to go join him, and he does. So as a result of this intervention, as a result of this divine appointment, there is now a divine message seen in verses 30 and 31. And the message is coming from the prophet Isaiah. And he's reading it, and the eunuch does not understand it. I need someone to help me understand it. And Philip is there because of the divine appointment, and he's ready with the divine message. This divine message then focuses on the divine sacrifice in verses 32 through 35. And you're familiar with these verses. The portion that he was reading comes out of Isaiah 53, which was all about Jesus Christ 800 or so years before he came. Led as a sheep to slaughter, lamb before his shear is silent. His life was taken away, yet his offspring learn of him. What can this mean? Who can this be? And Philip, through instruction, and I love... Uh, I love how he handles the divine sacrifice in verse 35. Philip opened his mouth, beginning with this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. No doubt he preached that entire portion of Isaiah 53. No doubt he preached the life of Christ, the virgin birth, growing up, the humble shoot in Nazareth. No doubt he preached the persecution of Jesus. No doubt he preached the crucifixion, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the new life. And no doubt, no doubt he preached the commands of Jesus, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Because the next verse in verse 38, uh, verse 36 rather, they come upon water, imagine that, in the desert, and the next thing out of the eunuch's mouth is, look water, what keeps me from being baptized? So with all that as kind of setting the scene here, I want to ask some questions. What is happening in verses 36 through 39? We'll just spend the rest of our time in there. What is happening with this issue of baptism? I want to ask you five very brief questions about this text and about baptism in general. What is going on? He's, he's being baptized. He says, what prevents me from being baptized, verse 36? And then in 38, it says, um, after... Uh, after they both went down into the water and he baptized them. What, what is going on with this word? What is Christian baptism? Well, let me just put it very simply for you. Baptism simply is this. It is a ceremony by which a person is immersed into water. That's all. Nothing really fancy about that. It is a ceremony by which a person is immersed into water. It comes from the Greek word bapto, which means to dip into or to immerse. And it is often used of the word of uh, dyeing fabric in, in Greek. And to dye fabric, you have to dip it into the water. Baptizo is an intensified form of this word. And this simply means many times in the New Testament to dip completely into water. In fact, it is a Greek word that is used for drowning. Now, don't worry, those of you on the baptism list this uh, summer, we're not going to drown you. We'll barely keep you under just for a quarter of a split second. But it is, just so you know, this is the Greek behind this 
this term. And the, the, the translators did not want to translate this. They just said, we, we don't want to mess with this word. There's a beta here. There's an alpha here. So that turns into B-A-P-T-Z-O. And they just, they, they didn't, they stepped away from the term and just said, we're just going to transliterate this term. It's interesting, the Latin translates the term. You want to guess what the Latin calls it? Immersio. Submersio. They translate it. And I just point this out to let you know that there is a completely different Greek word for sprinkling. It's rantizo. And it's not used anywhere in the New Testament for baptism. So understanding that Bapto or baptizo means immersion is the only way it makes sense. Now let me apply it to some scriptures here. John 3.23, John was immersing near Ainon and Salim because there was much water there and he had to get the people under the water. Mark 1.5, John was baptizing near the Jordan River, or in the Jordan River rather, whose widest point is 20 yards and whose deepest area is 17 feet deep. It's a lot of water. Mark 3, uh, Matthew 3.16, when Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. We see similar language in our text here. Verse 38, they went down into the water. Verse 39, they came up out of the water, indicating there was a, a good amount of water. And so the significance of this word immersion, baptism, can only be understood through immersion. Now before we go much further on this, I want to explain a couple other, I want to explain one more idea to you here. There is such thing as dry baptism. Did you know this? This may be of news to you. There is a dry baptism. How can baptism be dry if it's water? Okay, again, the concept is immersion, right? And uh, we use this in our English every day. We speak of, um, you know, that person underwent a real baptism of fire. Have you ever said that or have you ever heard that said? All that means is that this person was just immersed in a very difficult, trying situation, baptized. And uh, we, we see this used in, uh, you know, he was immersed in his thought or immersed in his work, things like that. That's dry. There's no water involved in that. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says the children of Israel were immersed into Moses, meaning they associated with him as their leader. There was solidarity. There was union. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit we are all immersed into Christ. And John 3 says unrepentant unbelievers will be immersed one day if they don't turn in the full wrath of God. So really, that's all that means. What, what does Christian baptism mean? It just means to immerse. And of course, we see the examples in water. I want to ask another question here. What is the significance of it? You say, why do we do this ceremony? Why do we practice this ceremony? Well, I want to tell you that the, uh, the picture that Christian baptism paints is profoundly, profoundly important, and it is crystal clear in Scripture. I'd like you to turn to Romans chapter 6 to get just a picture of this. The picture that we attempt to show with Christian baptism is that you have been united with Christ, watch this, in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. Did you catch that? That is the picture that we are seeking to proclaim with baptism. Now, if you're at Romans 6, and if you, if you write in your Bible, look at verse 3, and it'd be good to... Um, Write the word dry in your margin if you, would, if, you, if you write in your Bibles. This is a dry baptism. Paul says, Do you not know that all of us have been immersed into Christ Jesus, uh, that have been immersed, have also been immersed into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through immersion into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in newness of life. For if we've become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be united in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him and that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. He goes on in 7, 8, and 9, describing this fact that somehow, spiritually, some way, it reaches back when we exercise faith in Christ, when we become 
a Christian, somehow we are placed backwards into Christ. And somehow his life as he lived perfectly becomes our life. And as he was placed on that cross, somehow we were in him also placed on that cross. And as he died and was placed in that grave, somehow we were in that grave with him. And as he was risen from the dead, somehow we were also risen from the dead. That is what it means to be united to Christ, ladies and gentlemen. That is what it means to be immersed or baptized into Christ. And there's not a drop of water involved in that. And... This picture of death, burial, and resurrection is critical. Water baptism, you say, well, why do we do it in water then? Because water baptism pictures physically what has occurred already in the believer's heart spiritually. Submersion into water illustrates we have been submerged, uh, submerged into Christ. Paul also says in Galatians 3.27, for we all were immersed into Christ and we have been clothed with Christ. He's just looking for all these illustrations, clothed, wrapped, enveloped in Christ. And so it's a beautiful, beautiful picture of death, burial, resurrection. It's also a picture of total cleansing. We won't go there, but you could jot down Titus 3, 5, where he speaks about the washing of regeneration. Regeneration, being born again, washes you spiritually. It cleanses you from sin. And then the waters of baptism picture that cleansing from sin. Well, there's so much more we want to talk about here. Let's ask another question here of the text. Who should be baptized? Who should be baptized? We've looked at what it means, what it pictures. Verse 37 gives us a clue here. I don't want to get into the textual criticism of this verse. But in 37, you you noted I skipped over that. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, don't be stumbled by this fact, but there are portions of Scripture that are debated whether they were in the original text, and this is one of them. However, rest assured that Philip, if he's preaching Christ, Philip, of all people, is going to preach the importance of faith, the importance of repentance, the importance of trusting Christ, believing in Christ. That's part of preaching Christ, right? So that's already in there. But somebody felt that it was important to to underscore this, and it's certainly true. Nothing there is false. But who should be baptized? Only those who believe in Christ should be baptized. Only those. Nowhere in Scripture do we ever see unbelievers being baptized. Nowhere are we commanded to baptize unbelievers. Rapid-fire verses here. Just... Just note these, if nothing else, in your mind. Those, baptism is reserved, first of all, for those who have repented of their sins. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, each one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Not to get forgiveness of sins, but because of forgiveness of sins, we are to be baptized. Secondly, it is reserved for those who receive the word. Acts 2.41, remember that great day of Pentecost. 3,000 received the word of God, and 3,000 were baptized. There wasn't a portion who received and believed and then kind of waited it out a little bit and then got baptized later. That that wasn't how it was in the early church. 3,000 believed, 3,000 were baptized. Making a connection here between believers and baptism. Baptism is reserved for... For those who receive the word, who believe, Acts 12, when when Philip said, if you believe, you should be baptized, both men and women. He includes women in this. Those who receive the Holy Spirit, Acts 10, 47. Surely no one can refuse these who have received the Holy Spirit, Peter says. And then probably the most clearest text on this, Matthew 28, 20. Those who have been made disciples. And those who are taught to obey Jesus Christ should be baptized. Go into all the world, making disciples, baptizing them. So in summary, baptism is for believers only. You might ask, well, how young of a believer could we we do this? I don't know. There's, There's no rules. There's no strict stipulation on this. But I would say, how young can a person really believe? And how young can they understand that? In the case of my wife, she... She can testify to faith in Christ as young as five years old. And she was baptized at age six. 
Me, on the other hand, I was first baptized, actually down at the old First E Free, at 10 or 11. I can't remember exactly when it was. I was 10 or 11 at the advice of my mother attempting to have a Christian home, and I was baptized. But you know what? I then later went on to live a very ungodly lifestyle, which demonstrated to me, if none other, that I really wasn't understanding what it meant to follow Christ. And I later became baptized again at age 22. And I knew that time there was no looking back. That time it took. And so I can't answer the age, but the issue is, is do you have a commitment to follow Christ? And that's kind of what verse 37 is kind of speaking to there. I want to ask another important question here. What is the effect of baptism? What happens as a result of being baptized? Well, first I want to underscore one more time that baptism does not save you. We should, we should have that, we should have a clear understanding of that. Uh, 35 here, if you look at verse 35, pre preaching Jesus is what saves people. And we need to always underscore that. Even with a, a strong emphasis on baptism, which we have in this church, it's it's Christ that saves. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And that's what we saw in verse 35 there. This eunuch uh, heard a word of Christ. Think about this. If baptism were necessary for salvation, Paul just would have went around baptizing everybody. Who cares where you're at spiritually? If it's just, if we believe in baptismal regeneration, let's just get everybody baptized. And this is interesting that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 14, he says, I'm glad that I baptized none of you. Interesting, coming from an apostle. If it's so crucial for salvation, I baptize none of you. You don't think Paul would have been a little bit more interested in baptism if it was required for salvation? Of course. He says, Christ didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach. And those that believe it saves you have a real hard time with um, the thief on the cross, right? Right? He's hanging on the cross next to Jesus. He, he demonstrates faith, and Jesus promises him, this day you will be with me in paradise. There was no time to be baptized. But nonetheless, even though baptism doesn't save you, it does produce certain things. Baptism is no different than any other form of Christian obedience. It's no different than obeying Christ in any area of your life. It is just the believer's first step. It is simply obedience. And obedience to Christ means you, you love Christ and you want to serve him. Baptism does result in some things. Look at verse 39 here. They came up out of the water. Spirit took Philip away. Eunuch saw him no more, but note this, went on his way, what? Rejoicing. Rejoicing. Baptism, in a sense, brings out rejoicing, not because of the ceremony, but because there's a certain joy in obeying Christ, right, with a clear conscience, understanding that this is something that brings honor to him, and, and he rejoiced, and no doubt Philip rejoiced. Baptism will produce the joy of obedience, and it results in a life that is right with Christ. Baptism also demonstrates the genuineness of your faith. This kind of speaks to that issue in Acts 2, where 3,000 heard and believed and received the word of God and were baptized. Meaning, these 3,000 are manifesting the reality of their faith through the waters of baptism. And it was serious back then. If you were baptized, you possibly could be run out of country, home, property, and even your life would be up for grabs. And it demonstrates that, hey, listen, don't touch those waters of baptism unless you're for real, because this could be your life. That was a real concern back then. And there was no such thing as unbaptized believers in this early church, not for long at least. Baptism also builds the faith of others, does it not? Are you not encouraged when we have our baptism celebrations and you hear the testimonies up front and you see the joy and the exhilaration of those coming out of the waters? 
Picturing death, burial, and resurrection, it's my death, burial, and resurrection. Picturing I was dirty and now I'm clean. Not in the water sense, but in the metaphorical, physical sense of what this celebrates in our lives. Baptism builds the faith of others. It opens you up also to greater areas of responsibility and stewardship. Note that. Jesus said, he who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. And sometimes I think this speaks to what I mentioned in the introduction, is that we, we sometimes spin our wheels as Christians for a lot of reasons, but one of those reasons could be that you haven't begun obedience in the smallest thing, the little thing, and you want to, you desire the greater thing, and there's nothing saying that God will deliver that if we are not first demonstrating faithfulness in the little things. The Ethiopian here, no doubt, shared his faith with others, built up others as a result of this, and engaged in greater stewardship. We don't know, but no doubt that occurred. And finally, I just want to say that baptism proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ, does it not? Every one of the testimonies that come up here, every individual is speaking, preaching, announcing, pronouncing the good news of Jesus Christ through their Christian testimony. You say, well, I'm not a good witness or I'm not a good evangelist. Do you have a story? Do you have a conversion story? That's all it is, is telling your story, and there's nothing to be nervous about that. That's your story, and it's unique to you. And there was probably some form of divine intervention that happened, resulting in a divine appointment with you and somebody sharing the word of God with you, the divine message, the word about Christ, and loving and coming to the divine Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us have that same basic outline, how God invaded our lives, and all, all baptism is is testifying to that. It is the equivalent of, it is the counterpart, I should say, of uh, the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. The Lord has left us with two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And it's interesting that in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, it says that as often as you eat of this, and as often as you drink of this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we have regular Lord's Suppers to proclaim, to proclaim and announce the Lord's death until he comes. And baptism also sends a message, does it not? It sends a message about the death, burial, and resurrection and cleansing that is available to man. So what happens when we're baptized? A lot happens. A lot happens. Well, we've been talking a lot about this. I want to land this today with one last question. No more questions. A couple more answers here after this. And the last question I take from verse 36. Would you look at that? It says, as they went along the road, they came to some water. <laughs> Speaking of, and the, and the eunuch said, look, water. What prevents me from being baptized? This is probably one of the most important questions that I will have asked this morning. The Ethiopian asks it of himself. And I would like you to put yourself in the seat of the Ethiopian. Your life has been intervened upon by God and by God's messenger and by God's message and by God's Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know him, you love him, you serve him. What prevents me, ask yourself, from being baptized? What, what prevents you? Despite this clear command in Scripture, despite the, the amazing significance that the act portrays, there does remain widespread, I guess we could call it, non-compliance, kind of a laissez-faire about being baptized. And when that non-compliance is present in a church or in an individual or in somebody's heart, it reveals certain heart uh, conditions. And I'm just going to run a few of them by you. And maybe if you have not been baptized, maybe you will find yourself in one of these. One area is that you could simply be ignorant, right? You could just not be taught. And there are many people in the church that just are not taught on this topic. 
Lessons on baptism are rare. Discussions on baptism are rare. Books on baptism are very rare. Sermons on baptism are very rare. And it kind of goes without saying that you could have been converted long ago and just never heard a single message on baptism or never been poked or prodded or asked or suggested and you're just kind of going through life. Well, I hope today you can no longer claim ignorance. We've learned a little bit about baptism, have we not? And there's so much more we could have said. But now we've been taught, so we could probably check that off the, the list. If you're not ignorant, maybe it's an issue of pride. Sometimes we're just proud as believers. You're saved, you're for real. I'm not trying to scare you here, but you're just prideful. It's just hard to swallow your pride. And you say, oh, well, I don't want to be baptized because I go down looking pretty good, and I come up looking like a drowned sewer rat. <laughs> and my hairdo, or my makeup, or whatever. And it's pride. Or, or a deeper issue of pride is, you know, I've allowed a lot of time to go by since my conversion. <laughs> and a lot of years has passed. And I've done a lot of service in the name of Christ. Hi. I've influenced a lot of people. I've even maybe gone on missions trips. And I've engaged in the great co uh, omission, which I've turned into the great commission in my life because part of the great, did I, did I mess that up? Part of the great commission is to baptize people. And maybe you've even encouraged people to be baptized and you, you've never been obedient in this area. And that's going to take a little bit of swallowing of your pride and embarrassment to just acknowledge that and become willing, and that's okay. It never hurts anybody to do that. Our Ethiopian probably had reason to be prideful. I mean, he's of this court of Candace. He is the official in charge of all her money. I mean, uh, you know, he could say, uh, you know, but you know, what does he do? He stops the entourage in its tracks and he says, there's some water, let's do this. Uh, and I'm sure the people in the caravan are like, you know, what's, what, why are we stopping? What is he doing? Is he overheating? He's in the water? What's going on? And he's going to have some splaining to do to the court of Candace when he gets back that he was baptized on this trip. He, he didn't let pride get in his way. I say if you put baptism off from this point forward, who cares? Who cares? Step into the waters and be obedient to your Lord. If it's not ignorance and it's not pride, it might be indifference. You might just be indifferent about this, just can't be bothered. You know, some people, they are jet set, they're high flying, high priorities, spinning a lot of plates, a lot going on in life, and I just can't really get around to doing this. I'm just kind of indifferent about it. Yeah, it's a command. Yeah, I probably should, but I'm just not making this a priority in my life. And that's really too bad. That's really too bad to be, I, to be indifferent to a command of Christ which brings such honor to his name, which encourages the saints who witness it, which testifies to the lost who need the Lord, and you're just kind of indifferent. That's not good. Our Ethiopian saw this right away. He says, no, we're not going to wait till after lunch. We're not going to wait till my next trip to Jerusalem. We're not going to wait for the church picnic. We're going to do this now. And some people are just plain defiant. They're not indifferent. They're defiant. Maybe you know some people like this. The people of God throughout history, especially in the Old Testament, we see this, can be rebellious people of God. They can be stiff-necked. They can refuse to obey. And this is always and ever due to a pattern of sin in their life, sometimes private, sometimes public, but it's a result of sin in their lives. And they know if... If, if to nobody other than themselves, they know that being baptized will elevate that a little bit to my attention. And, you know, I, I don't want to testify in the waters of baptism because I'm entertaining this aspect of sin and that it exposes my hypocrisy a little bit, if nothing else, to, to just me. Maybe others don't know about it, but I'm, I'm sensitive to this and I'm disobeying in great areas of my life. And so why would I obey in this issue of baptism. 
And then the last thing that it could possibly be, if, if you're not ignorant, and you're not prideful, and you're not indifferent to it, and you're not defiant, some people are just not a Christian. And they have no desire for Christian baptism because they have no allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would I? Why would I be baptized? I don't want to be associated with Christ. I don't want to be identified publicly, formally, officially, spiritually with Jesus Christ. I don't want you to think that I'm somehow immersed into Christ. I'm not living for Christ. And I would say if this is you, I would encourage you as your first step to come to know Jesus Christ. This is the believer's first step. Baptism, right, is the believer's first step. The unbeliever's first step is to come to Christ. And if you don't know him, I want to tell you, you can know him. Go to Isaiah 53 and you'll learn of him. Read the New Testament Gospels and you'll learn of him. He loves sinners. You'll learn that he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, burdened down with sin, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. When do you want to lose your heavy yoke of sin and exchange it for my light load, Jesus says. It's light. My burden is light because he relieves you of the pressure of guilt and sin. He wants to forgive you. He wants to gather you in. And so how about you today as we close? It probably can't be ignorance. It probably can't be pride. It could be pride. It could be indifference. It could be defiance. And it could be that I'm just speaking to some people out there who haven't come to faith yet. And I hope that this helps you as we look forward to the day that's coming here soon. We look forward to the celebration. We go into it with a little bit deeper understanding as to what we're doing. We're not just getting wet and cooling off on a hot day. We are picturing some amazing, amazing truth here in baptism. Well, thank you for your attention today. I trust that this will uh, resonate with you. If you have been baptized, thank you for your obedience. Thank you for your great example to others. Let's stand as we're dismissed here. We'll, we'll say a short prayer here, and we'll be on our way to enjoy this wonderful day. Thank you for your attention. Would you bow your head with me as we uh, just kind of process some of this before the Lord? No doubt some of you here this morning believe in Christ and confess him as Savior and Lord of your life, and you love him, and you want to serve him, and you have a deep desire to obey him, but you have not ever taken the very first step of faith in being baptized, or perhaps you have not been baptized in a biblical way. And as I mentioned, in three short weeks, we are going to celebrate the beautiful lives that have surrendered to this wonderful, wonderful ceremony. You're going to hear their testimonies. You're going to hear the story of grace in their lives. And I just want to ask you today, if you have not been baptized, would you consider joining them that day? Would you consider reaching out to a pastor here or putting a little note maybe in the offering on the way out, or calling the church office and say, I'd like to be baptized. We, we are here to help you and serve you, and we will receive you with open arms, and nobody's going to be embarrassed about this. It doesn't mean you have to become a member of this church. It doesn't mean you have to start supporting this church. It just means you want to be obedient. And for those who have been baptized... Would you encourage others? Would you encourage maybe your family and your friends, others who, who need to take this first step of obedience and victory in the Christian life so that they can then be in charge of greater and greater things as they serve the Lord? Father, we thank you for the profound example of this Ethiopian eunuch. One day we're going to see him in heaven. One day we're going to rejoice with him as he rejoiced on earth. And we're going to rejoice with him, Lord, not because he checked off some church ceremony, 
but because he heard a word about Christ and it made all the difference to him and it changed his life and it brought him from despair to hope. I pray that every person here would experience that today, that they would look to Christ, that they would love Christ and come to Christ and then having come to Christ, they would take that first step of obedience, Lord. Work in every heart. Would you stir us, Lord? Would you challenge us this day? Don't let us rest until we all are faithful to this important, important command, which brings your son such honor. We just want to honor him, Lord. Help us, Lord. Be our guide. Be our strength. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.